Hello, welcome back to the channel. Um, I just wanted to make this video to show you this cool little guy which I've been restoring a couple of months ago. Um, and there are still some small things that need to be done and we'll do that in this video and then this one is completely finished. Um, as you see this is a quite small and compact radio just as a reference. Um, if you see compared to this marker here it's really nice compact table radio in fact. Um, so this is a Sierra 1022U, um, which is maybe internationally a quite uncommon brand, but it's rather common still in Belgium, well, on the second hand market because the brand doesn't exist anymore, but this brand is quite common in Belgium and also in the Netherlands. Um, and it's basically a sub-brand of Philips. So this radio dates from 1955 and in this period uh, Philips had a strategy of creating a number of sub-brands like Sierra but also an example, another example is uh, Aristona um, and their strategy was basically to increase their market share by just creating other brands. So if you then were in a shop um, and you had the option to choose between a Philips or a Sierra or an Aristona radio you were it's basically the same because you were buying a Philips radio. Um, as a result of that, this is basically a Philips radio because the chassis inside this radio is exactly the same chassis as the one of a Philips BX253U. Uh, um, and um, this chassis has was quite common. It was used in in in, in more radios than just this one or the BX253U. Uh, um, it has also a lot of similarities with the original um, Philips Filetta, which was, uh, I think, intended for the German market and which has become quite famous, has created a cult following, let's say. Um, so the chassis inside is purely Philips. Um, there is also no service manual for this radio available, so you have to use the service manual for the Philips BX253U, which is um, yeah exactly the same as this one. The only thing which is unique for the Sierra brand is of course the, the, the looks. So everything which you see, the casing is made from Bakelite. Um, and the, the dials and the buttons, uh, not well, not the buttons, probably not, but the dials and the grill, they are um, unique to, to the Sierra model. Uh, everything inside is Philips. What is also important to mention about this radio is that the power supply is a transformerless design, um, or it's sometimes also called a hot chassis radio, which means that in theory you could plug this radio into a wall socket uh, which has DC um, voltage. Of course today this is not valid anymore because DC voltage on, on, on mains, power, uh, mains um, power doesn't really exist anymore and I think honestly in 1955 it would also have already been obsolete. Um, but the advantage of course of not using a transformer is that you can make the radio smaller and lighter. The disadvantage however is that um, working on this radio becomes a lot more dangerous because as there is no transformer inside the um, main volt, the, the radio is operating directly on main voltage, mains voltage, which means that depending on how you plug in uh, the plug into your wall socket um, the live wire could be directly connected to the chassis of the radio. Um, which means that if you are working on it, and this is the case, um, and you touch the chassis, you're basically dead, because you can get a shock which is directly uh, mains voltage. 
Well, operating such a radio in under normal conditions is still rather safe because everything is shielded inside. Um, it becomes dangerous when there is uh, some metal exposed. So, for example, if a knob would come loose, this can be dangerous. Um, also, if the back panel would become loose, this can also be quite dangerous. Um, well, very dangerous, in fact. And the only thing preventing the um, full mains voltage to come here on some of the external connections. So you have here external connections for the for an external speaker or for a gramophone input. The only thing preventing mains voltage from being av uh, available here on these connections is a simple capacitor. So if this capacitor is failing, then uh, after many years of use, then this can also be uh, quite dangerous. So please be careful when operating these types of radios, especially when working on it. Um, the very, very least thing you should do when working on a radio like this is using an isolation transformer. It's even mentioned in the original manual of uh, 1955. So please, please be careful um, or you really might kill yourself if you're, uh, if you're not careful while working on this type of radio. Um, so what still has to be done on this one? Uh, two things. First of all, there is one screw here at the bottom. I don't know if you can clearly see it um, here, which is not threading anymore. So the, the thread is completely gone. So I have to repair that one. But one thing which is on the outside. And then on the inside, there is one capacitor which still needs to be replaced. Um, for the rest, it's working quite well. So first, let me take the chassis out of the radio and I can show you uh, what I mean. Uh, to take the chassis out this is actually quite simple and it's a bit different from what you would normally expect. Um, so you just unscrew these screws. I'm not going to detach the speaker because uh, this is enough. I'm now able to reach the capacitor that I still need to change. So the capacitor which still needs to be changed is over there on the side of the output transformer. Um, you can still it's, see it's still a uh, an old one. Um, so it's all the yellow ones here are capacitors which have been changed. Now why haven't I changed that one? Well, simply because I forgot to order it initially. And the reason why I forgot to order it was that it was not mentioned on the schematic. So as you see here, this is how I was marking which capacitors needed to be changing. And you, you notice that here I added another one because this one was not drawn here on this diagram. But it was also not drawn on the schematic. And then when I, when I was ordering capacitors, I, um, I just forgot that one because it was not... Uh, in the, of course, then also not mentioned here in the list of the um, capacitors in the in the manual, so I, I just forgot that one. Um, so I had to order it afterwards, and it's due to the COVID situation currently. It took quite a while to arrive, so and now it finally arrived. So this is a schematic, and it's this capacitor here which I'm talking about. You can see it's actually drawn on the schematic, but the value is wrong. Um, also, there are a couple of, this here a capacitor and a resistor, which are not on the, 
uh, on the on the schematic and that's uh, this blue capacitor and this uh, red resistor here these two they are not on the schematic um, so I added those here and also the value of the pot meter here which is the tone control it's also uh, incorrect so here it states that it's 500k and I measured this to be 700k so what's the reason for this the answer is I don't know um, probably maybe the schematic is just wrong um, or maybe this is one of the differences between the Sierra model and the Philips model because maybe changing here a bit of the circuit for the tone control maybe was a strategy to differentiate between the different types of brands so maybe that the Sierra then would sound a bit different than the Philips I honestly have no idea could also just be a uh, something which is missing on the schematic anyway um, the only capacitor that I still need to change is this one so the uh, C83 and that's how it looks like with the new capacitor in place um, it was quite a bit of fiddling to get it in there it's not really that easy to access um, but let me show you what I also did on the uh, bottom side of the chassis first I'm going to put the chassis back into the cabinet and then I can show you what I also replaced already earlier uh, on the bottom side of the chassis so this is the bottom side of the chassis and as you can see it's very very cramped in here it's mainly because of the size of the radio because it's so small all the yellow caps are ones that have been replaced some of them were really difficult to replace for example this one because it's connected all the way down there um, so it was not always easy to reach all the solder points this orange cap has also been replaced um, this one and I think there is another one were shielded caps which I had to create myself so I took one of the yellow caps and then um, I added uh, a shielding around it using um, metal yeah, foil paper and I uh, soldered a lid to the to the shielding it must be some other one somewhere because I remember I did it twice but I I don't find it ah oh, there it is that one there is another one um, and then of course you need to put some shrink ramping around it um, and then this, this, cap, this cap is also new and then at the top side there is the can the filter can so now the radio is upside down of course but this is a filter can which is basically an electrolytic capacitor which uh, the inside which was removed the inside of it was removed and then uh, restuffed with new uh, capacitors so all capacitors which need to be replaced are replaced on this radio um, and now the only thing I still need to do is to um, repair the thread in this hole so that I can screw the the cover correctly on it now how will I do that I'm going to use I'm going to try to use isopon so this is a sort of a filler which is mainly intended to repair um, uh, the bodywork of a car um, I have two types of isopon P31 and P40 um, I think I'll be using the P30 uh, sorry P38 and P40 I think I'll be using the P38 which is the um, which is the less hard the softer one of the two um, the P40 contains fiberglass uh, yeah glass fiber uh, which makes it very very strong um, the problem however I think is that since I need to then drill a hole in it and um, put a new screw in the in the hole I think my, maybe the P40 might be too strong to do that and might um, cause maybe some cracking in the in the Bakelite because Bakelite is not super strong so what I'll try to do is to fill the hole with P38 then drill a new hole inside and then let's hope that the, the new screw fits and the new screw is um, um, the, the thread is repaired so I filled up the hole now I'm going to leave it dry and then sand it, sand it a bit the excess paste I'm just going to send it off a bit 
and then I'm going to drill a new hole uh, through the uh, through the paste there where the the original hole was a bit smaller than the size of the screw and then I'm hoping that the screw will automatically thread itself into the new paste that I have applied here I drilled a new hole slightly smaller than the um, thread size of the screw the screw was three millimeters and I drilled a hole of uh, two millimeters diameter and then now I screwed the, the screw back in there and it's gripping quite nicely but I'm going to leave it like this just to let it harden a bit more and then hopefully when I pull it out and attach the back plate again then it will still grip uh, let's see at the moment I think it's the best I can do and it worked quite well actually the screw is nice and tight in there now um, I imagine that if I would unscrew it and screw it back in for 10 times or so then it will probably be uh, loose again but for now this is fine because the radio the restoration of this radio is finished anyway so I don't imagine that I will be removing this screw uh, again for, for, quite, uh, for quite often or quite soon um, so yeah now the only thing that leaves me is to give you a demo of how this thing actually sounds the main amplifier tube in this radio is a UL41 and um, they are quite known to, to take quite a while to warm up so let me let me show you, I'm going to turn on the power here so if I turn on the radio of course the lights light up but um, it will take a while before it actually starts playing a bit longer than an, than an average tube radio I think If you're hearing some noise, that's the rain on the roof. It's not a, not the a radio making noise yet. Yeah, so there it is. So let's start with long wave. Um, it's past nine o'clock here in Belgium, so we should be getting quite some stations. Um, Well, on all AM bands should be quite okay at this time of day. This is long wave. Sounded like Russian. We both achieve some distinction in this. This is BBC World Service. And all the time I was working with Arthur, I was doing some film roles. Arthur was going off and doing some One wave is receiving really well. And it's just it using the built in ferrite antenna. So the relationship when it became it's, very it's quite, uh, the reception is really good using the built in antenna. I was getting equal recognition to him. So I have like five or six stations on long wave, I think. Not all of them are uh, usable, but... Okay, let's try short wave. That's French. That's also French. Still in the 49, millim 49 meter band here. sensitive to pick up a station it's not easy some of them are really close to each other That 
it uh, sounds like Chinese. I, I'm not an expert, but uh, I know that uh, Chinese radio stations do have repeaters in Eastern Europe, so we could be picking one of those up. So shortwave is also working very well. Cannot stop on music because otherwise my video will be at um, copyright flag. German. Oh. Cannot stop on music. But I, I already like, quite like the sound quality on AM is is quite okay. Okay, it will never be perfect. It's AM, but um, it's quite okay. Now let's try medium wave. It's really full of stations. Again, Russian, I think. That's Spanish. This is a song that he wrote, but it was uh, that's again BBC World Service, I think. With the other band. It really. It's, there are so many stations here on medium wave. It's. Uh, Ian Joseph Higgs, Piers Morgan, actor Stephen Graham. Good morning, Stevie. Good morning. Paul Weller, Gallagher. Nice and then. Like, I'm gonna go a bit faster. No. That's a bit less of the stations here, but uh the real sound quality of the radio is of course in the FM band, so now let's try FM. Quel plaisir d'écouter votre émission. J'ai l'impression de me retrouver à une quarantaine d'années en arrière, dans les années 68, 69, à l'internat de really, à écouter. I really love the sound. It's, it's really sounding very, very nice. C'est le parrain de votre Especially radio. Especially speech is sounding fantastic. C'est Franck fantastic. qui nous envoie ce message. Franck, grand merci à vous. Euh... Ja, dat stop om nu. Wakker maken door die goede muziek. Met onder andere Dist van Purple Disco Machine. Eminem Party. Mix and match. Erwin de Nul en Laura Sluiten. Some, some new station somewhere. Or that's music. Did the radio show. Cool, man. It's nice to hear. Yeah. Shout out to you. <laughs> of course. I think. Just trying to find some uh, something which I can show without uh, getting copyright uh, flagged. Nope.
Um, this station, I'm not picking it up. Well, so... fait à Paris en 1898 avant d'être créé en italien euh, en 1901 donc ce peut, ceci peut expliquer évidemment pourquoi Raoul Pugno connaissait cette pièce de Dan Unzio. Voici maintenant le deuxième acte de cet opéra Tone Toujours control is not also working quite well after replacing the capacitor de l'opéra de Göteborg <musique> is een ongeval gebeurd ten hoogte van Roeselaar Beveren op de rechter rijstrook. So, um, that's it. That's about it for this video, I guess. Um, next video will be probably be again about the restoration of the Grundig uh, 5995. So, um, if you are interested in following that one, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and. Um, See you next time. Bye-bye.